Equal the Free Gift podcast, where we ground believers in their identity in Christ and equip them to reach out to those caught in religion. We're glad you joined us. So last week we were in the book of Hebrews and we were talking about faith. And we talked about the fact that faith is not an end in itself, but it's rather the means to an end. It's really the thing that you have faith in that matters. And whether that thing is dependable, trustworthy, or not. And that can go for if you have faith in yourself, if you have faith in another person, if you have faith in a thing that you've placed your trust in. And really, if we ask ourselves honestly, if we have our faith in anywhere but God, then our faith is misguided. Because none of those things, including ourselves, can ultimately come through and provide for us the things that we're needing and one that we would ultimately place our trust in. And so today I wanted to talk about those questions that we asked in relation to God last week. And who is the God that we place our trust in, that we have faith in, that we depend upon? And we're going to look through the book of Hebrews for our answers. And the book of Hebrews gives us some really clear answers to a lot of burning questions that people have about the nature of God. And so we're going to go ahead and jump right in. We're going to be in verse or chapter 1 to begin. So to ask the question, is God separate from his creation? Or part of it. Now, this is acknowledging that you know you believe in God and you believe that He's the Creator of all things, and the Book of Hebrews just kind of kind of assumes that it doesn't give any kind of argument for that, but it states very clearly that Jesus, in fact, is the Creator of all things. Hebrews chapter one verse two says, "God has in these last days spoken unto us by His Son." whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. And Hebrews 11.3 says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And so what we see very clearly is that God is the creator of all things, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. And that Jesus specifically is associated with that creation, that he is the creator of all things. And this speaks to the fact that God is not completely separate from his creation, that God, in fact, is the one who created. Now, there's worldviews out there that, um, such as Gnosticism. And Gnosticism, is one of their core beliefs is that there is a dualism between good and evil. And that um, all matter is evil. And that all, everything spiritual is good. And so if you imagine a God who is good, then he couldn't have been the physical creator of our physical universe and the things that are physically around us, that he would have to have had created the world through an intermediary. And this influenced a lot of Greek thought, and it got influenced into Christianity as Greek um, culture kind of tried to take on Christianity in certain branches, and it formed this belief called Gnosticism. And Gnosticism had a lot of problems because Christianity is not coherent with that kind of mentality. You all of a sudden have a problem with creation. You have a problem with a physical incarnation that God would actually become human flesh. You have problems with God dying on a cross, and you have problems with God physically rising again from the dead. And some of these things creep into some of the worldviews that are around us. And the Bible is clear, though, that God, while he is transcendent from his creation, meaning that he's not a part of his creation, he doesn't disassociate himself from his creation. And the other thing that this speaks to on the other end is 
pantheism and panentheism, okay? And panentheism is kind of like the force in Star Wars, you know? The episode seven came out, and you have the good and the dark side of the force. And those two are always um, influencing everything. And the force is the thing that moves in us and through us. And, and so the, the universe itself and everything in it is a part of God. Okay? And, um, and then pantheism would be more like God is in everything. Okay? And so there's a distinction there. And that would be like Hinduism and Buddhism and a lot of the Eastern religions are of this mentality. And so you have this balance between good and evil and the yin and the yang and all of those different things that come out of those worldviews. And the Bible declares with, very, with a lot of clarity that God has always been, that God is the eternal one, that God has always existed and as we're going to get to it, he has a need of nothing, that he is completely self-sufficient in his being, and that he created the heavens and the earth, and he did it with the words of his mouth. And God said, let there be, and there was. So another question that people ask in relation to God is, does he interact with his creation? So now that we know that he created the heavens and the earth and everything that there is and that he's transcended from his creation, does he actually interact with his creation? And this is what the deist worldview, a lot of the founding fathers of our country, not all of them, but some of them were deists. And deists believe that there is a creator, but they would liken him to a watchmaker. Um, you know, somebody who winds it up sets it, designs it, and just lets it do its thing. And that God doesn't interact with the world. He doesn't intervene with the world. He just kind of created these laws of nature that we see in operation around us, like gravity and things like that. And he just kind of wound it up and let it go. So the question is, does God interact with his creation? Another... This is almost asking another question that's more personal. Does he care? Does he care? When God sees all of the things that are going on in the world, all the pain and the devastation and um, the trials, does God care about any of it? Um, or did he intend for it? And what's he going to do about it? And all those types of things. Does God interact with his creation? And here's what the book of Hebrews says in chapter 2, verse 4. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. And so the answer from the author of Hebrews is absolutely yes. 100% without a shadow of a doubt, God interacts with his creation. Yes, God does care. Yes, God has a plan. God has a purpose. God has a meaning in everything. He is interacting and interested in everything. And one of the ways in which he attested this is with signs and wonders and miracles. And these are different words that describe different phenomenon in which you could just describe it and define it as God breaking the rules that he set when he created the heavens and the earth. The laws of nature, so to speak, that God created, he's above those things. And so Jesus, when he was on this earth, through the will of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, he would say to a storm that was raging, be still, and it obeyed. And it testified to the fact that Jesus was, in fact, God in human flesh. And signs and wonders and miracles happen, and they still happen. God's still able to manifest himself and to inter interact with his creation through these means. 
And then he talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And this is really going a step further and into what we're going to get into at the end here is that God actually indwelling and coming inside of us as believers and giving us gifts and working through us and intending to do good through us as he lives out his life through us. So another follow-up question that people ask is, okay, well, if there's a God and he created the heavens and the earth and he interacts with this world, is he a good God or is he not? Is he holy or is he a sinner? Is he, has he arrived, so to speak? Or is he still progressing? And it's really interesting. You may think this is a no-brainer that if there's a God, he must be good, but not everybody believes that. And not even everybody who would say that they're Christian believes this. Provided you've heard the couplet, as man is, God once was, as God is, man may be. Do you believe it's possible that God the Father could have been a sinner in a past mortal probation like us, learning yeah. to become what we can become? Um, I do. You know, I think that making mistakes is part of a, uh, an essential part of a learning process. So, I mean, if you follow logic and reason, um, then, I, then I think that's definitely a distinct possibility. Sure. Does it doesn't it make him any less powerful or anything. Does it bother you that you'd be worshiping a God who was once like us in the sense that he was a sinner? I mean, no, it makes me more comfortable, actually. So, I mean, in the sense that... Uh, that we have hope to overcome. You know, if he could overcome and become as great as he is, then uh, then certainly we have hope to to overcome all of our trials and, and sinful natures as well. Absolutely, yes. I believe um, he went through the same things we did. He knows what we were going through. And he obviously lived his right, life right because he became a god, so he became our Heavenly Father. He's one of the greatest parents to ever live. And so Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10 says this, For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. And Hebrews twelve fourteen Follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Not only is God holy, but he calls us to be holy. He calls us to a life of holiness. He calls us to a life of, which basically means that you're set apart, you're different, you're, you're distinct from those around you. And t technically, to be fully holy, one has to be completely without sin. And this isn't saying that we have to arrive at some kind of point where we've completely rid sin out of our lives and that it's not a part of us. But it is saying that through God's grace, that the righteousness of Jesus, the one who lived a perfect life, he was tempted in every point yet without sin, his righteousness becomes imputed to us so that God, when he's looking at us, he sees the reflection of his son and his holiness, which has been credited to our account. But without Jesus, the gap between God and man is insurmountable. It says that he is light and he is clothed in light and in him is absolutely no darkness, not at all, as the apostle John would put it that if we walk with him, that we should walk in the light. But God in and of himself, he's completely without sin. He's completely void of fault, of error, of evil. He, there is nothing insufficient about him. He is completely holy in his character. And we, on the other hand, are not. We, on the other hand, are sinners. We're not holy. We're the opposite of holy, that apart from Jesus, because we've sinned, there is an insurmountable gulf between us and God. Jesus bridged that gap. And we'll get to that more 
in a moment. But God, absolutely, 100%, to me, the definition of God is one who is self-existent. He's eternal. He's always been God. He's the thing in which everything else derives its purpose and its meaning and that he would be absolutely good by definition. And so any version of God that claims that he is not holy, that he perhaps at one time was just like us and he was a sinner and he progressed to where he is today, that's not Christianity and it's not true. So the next question that people might ask is that, okay, he's the creator of the heavens and the earth. He interacts with this creation and he's holy, but is he self-sufficient? Meaning, does this God have need of something? Is he, um, or is he completely in and of himself, holy and without need of anything? And the author of Hebrews says this, Hebrews chapter one, verse three, his son, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Christianity and Christianity alone believes that God exists as one God within three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And earlier on in the series, we talked about this verse and that the, if you can imagine the sun without the rays that it gives off, or if you can imagine the rays of the sun without the sun itself, then you could imagine, as the author of Hebrews says, Jesus without the Father or the Father without Jesus. They're not two different gods. They are two different persons within one God, which also includes the Holy Spirit. This is sometimes hard to understand. It's grapple our minds around it and I encourage you into a further study of it. But here's two things that you can think about in reference to why the Trinity is a necessary thing and why the Bible teaches it, because it's absolutely true and it's absolutely necessary. Here's a couple of reasons why. The Bible says that God is love. And if God is good, you would expect him to be also love, that he, you would expect him to be loving. Now, love has to have an object of its affection. It can't exist in and of itself. It, it's not a feeling. It's an action. It's a verb. It's something that you do. And ask yourself the question, before God created the heavens and the earth, would he still be able to be said of him, he is love. And the Trinity allows for a God who for, it doesn't even tell us how much, you know, time or, you know, had passed before he made the decision that he wanted to create the heavens and the earth. But before that time had even come, it can be said of the Christian God, the biblical God, he is love. Love, because the Father loved the Son, who loved the Holy Spirit, who loved the Father and the Son. The other thing that you can contemplate is, in the Bible very clearly says that God is judge, that all of us will have to stand account before the God of, who is holy and whom we must give account. And... In the Old Testament, God gave a standard by which judgment must occur. And he says, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall a thing be established. And he took this so seriously that even in the Ten Commandments, one of those is you shall not bear false witness. And God has, in giving that law, I believe that he's given us a reflection of himself and so I believe that God is held accountable to the very laws in which he lays down. He's not above the law. He's limiting himself, so to speak, by the very laws that he expresses. And for God to limit himself in this way or express that judgment must occur this way, I believe it's showing us 
that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, all of us will be judged. And those two or three are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God and three persons. So another question you can ask somebody who doesn't believe in the Trinity is to ask them the question, how is God going to judge us if it's just him, if it's strictly him? So another question that people have in relation to God is, has he communicated with us? If he's the creator and he interacts us with creation and he's a holy God and he's self-sufficient and he's loving and he's a judge, has he communicated with us? Has he told us who we are? Has he, or where we came from, where we're going? How do we have a relationship with him? How, can we have a relationship with him? Has he answered these questions to us? For us, And the answer is absolutely. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1. God who at sundry times in a diverse manner spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. God went out of his way. And it says in various different ways he spoke through the prophets. And we talked about the prophets several weeks ago, and all that he did, and all of the messages that they, he gave through them, and even giving us um, what was going to happen in the future, not only in our day, but in their day, that he would tell Abraham what, he, what his ancestors were going to do when they went down to Egypt, and what, what was going to happen, and he spoke that same way and with such clarity to all of his people as history unfolded. And then last of all, he sent to us himself. He came in the person of Jesus, the Son, and God in the flesh. And so now we don't have need of prophets. We don't have need of continuing revelation. We don't have need of um, a person who stands as an intermediary between us and God and who speaks you know, the, as the mouthpiece of God or offers sacrifices for us from God. He's given us his word. He's given us his son. He's given us creation which speaks of him. And there's nothing else that needs to be said. His word, and this leads us to our next part of here, Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints of marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. When you open up the Bible, you're not just opening up a book, even though that's what the word Bible means in Greek. You're not just opening up a book. You're opening up God's revelation of himself to you. And it has to be spiritually discerned. And so what that means is people can read the Bible before they come to Jesus, but they're not going to really see it or understand it necessarily for what it is. The Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible. And so Paul says, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. You can look at it as if it's a hologram and the light in which created it in the first place has to be illuminated on it to bring out the three-dimensional image. And that image is always a Jesus. When you read the Bible, you're not just reading God's word to them, you're reading God's word to you. Now, we need to be careful when we say that and not just, you know, just assume that every single thing that you read is going to be written to you. We have to interpret it correctly. We have to, we have to use sound doctrine and sound hermeneutical rules and, and rules of interpreting the scripture, in other words. We need to be able to use that. And so many of the people that we converse with and talk with, they don't want to operate by those rules. They want to just kind of cherry pick certain verses and use them to prove certain doctrines that are unbiblical. But when you open up the word, the promise is 
that is going to be like a sword that comes in and it cuts between even your soul and your spirit. It discerns the thoughts of your heart that God is able to speak through a book that's 2,000 years old at best and several thousand years old in, in, in the oldest books. And he's able to speak into your life today. He's able to speak into your heart and tell you what his plan is for you today, what his intentions for you today. Your identity, which rests solely and completely in Jesus Christ, he can illuminate that for you today. So another question, if he's the creator and if he's good and if he's it interacts with his creation and if he's if he's communicated to us is he trustworthy is he trustworthy it, you know something that you ask if somebody's talking to you and telling you something it doesn't necessarily mean that what they say to you is true it doesn't mean that every time you go on google or wikipedia that what you read is true just because somebody said it so the question is, is he trustworthy? And the author of Hebrews again answers, absolutely yes. Hebrews 6.18, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge, to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Hebrews 10.23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. You know, just a second ago, we were talking about how God limited himself through the laws in which he gave us. And one of those that we just talked about is you should not bear false witness. And another way of putting that is you shouldn't lie. That means that lying is a violation of God's holiness and lying is a sin and God has absolutely no sin in him. He's absolutely 100% honest, 100% faithful, 100% dependable, 100% stable. You can absolutely put all of your confidence, all of your hope, all of your faith, everything in him. You can jump, as you see in the picture, you can jump into your father's arms and he will always catch you. He will always catch you. Is he merciful or vengeful? We read in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, that we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Hebrews 4.16, Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we might obtain mercy and find grace and to help in our time of need. In Hebrews 8.12, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. The question that's on everybody's minds is, you know, if God created us and we're held accountable to him and he's communicated his intentions so he can hold us accountable again and he's, he's come and communicated with us and he is good and he's holy and all of those things, the question remains, is he merciful or is he vengeful? Is he a God that when we mess up, is he just waiting to pounce on us? Is he a God, even as many believe, who kind of just weighs our good and our bad on the scale and you never know where you stand until the very end when you stand before him? So every day you live in fear. Or is the ancients believed, who believed in multiple gods who were not good and had different intentions and were always competing, the people always found themselves having to find favor with those gods. And they would have to do contradictory things sometimes to find themselves in favor with these various gods. And so it ruled their lives because they feared God. They feared his vengeance. They feared their vengeance. And so the question is, is the God of the Bible like that or is he not? 
And the answer is absolutely he is merciful and vengeful. The Bible is absolutely clear that God is absolutely holy. And because he's absolutely holy, he's absolutely just. As the judge who will stand over us, he is absolutely just. Every sin that has ever been committed will be accounted for. And there's one penalty for any sin, which is an eternal violation and rebellion against God. And that is separation, eternal separation from God. And sometimes we call that place hell. If you today are separated from Jesus, Jesus says the wrath of God abides on you. He is absolutely just. You will not fool him. You will not do anything that escapes his notice. He sees everything. He knows all. And he absolutely is just and holy. But in Christianity, in the God of the Bible, mercy and justice meet perfectly. You see, justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. And grace is getting what you don't deserve. The God of the Bible not only extends mercy to you, but he extends grace to you. And he does it in the person of Jesus. In the person of Jesus, we're told he was full of grace and truth. In Jesus, the intersection of justice and mercy meet at the cross. And as we talked about a couple weeks ago, that when Jesus died on the cross, he literally became sin. He took on all of the sin of the world. He literally became that sin, and the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus for that sin. And because of that, because of that, it says that we, if we accept what Jesus has done for us, if we trust in it completely, if we place our faith in him and what he did, then, as Hebrews 8.12 says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And as Hebrews 4.16 says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. God not only wants to extend mercy to you, but he also wants to extend grace. He wants to give you eternal life. He wants to give you himself and come and live on the inside of you and change you from the inside out. He wants to give you every spiritual blessing in Jesus Christ. He wants to give you his word. He wants to give you the gift of the fellowship of believers and the bo being a part of the body of Christ, which comes with a gift that he will give you abil an ability supernatural ability to be a part of his body. He will provide you with the resources that you need. He will provide you with the monetary supply that you need to, to, to fulfill his will. He will give you, he desires to extend his grace to you. Which leads us to this next question. Can we have a relationship with him? And the author of Hebrews answers this absolutely affirmatively. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, it says, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you unto his, as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For who the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons, 
For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you not sons? Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we have them reverence, gave them reverence. Shall we not much more be in subjection unto the Father of our spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. The Bible not only says we can have a relationship with God, but it says we literally, the moment we place our faith in Jesus, he adopts us into his family as his children. And as his children, he becomes our father. And as any earthly father does, he will chasten us. He will discipline us. And I want to make a distinction here between discipline and punishment. The punishment that God intends to give out was given out on Jesus on the cross when the wrath of God abided Uh, It was poured out on Jesus on that cross when he became our sin. God's intention for you as his children, as his son and his daughter, is as a loving father, is to discipline you. Discipline is training. Discipline is allowing the natural consequences of your actions to fall upon you. It's, you know, not intervening and saving you every time. It's not going overboard and giving retribution that has nothing to do with what you did. That's punishment. And punishment is intended to inflict pain and to, to punish you. Okay, It's punitive. Discipline is intended to bring correction. It's intended to bring training to the action that is consistent with the natural consequences of your actions. And so if you are lazy, then God is going to allow things to not work out for you, okay? If you, if you suffer from any number of sin, if you suffer from dishonesty, if you suffer from isolating yourself from other people and not fellowshipping, if you isolate yourself from his word or from prayer, there are natural consequences for those actions. There's the loss of the relationship, the loss of closeness. There's the consequence of being more vulnerable if you separate yourself from the body of Christ. There's natural actions, consequences for your actions. And the author of Hebrews is bringing out that like a good father, God will discipline his children. And his intention is for you. His intention is for your good, that his objective is that we might be partakers of his holiness. He's conforming us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ, who is the heir of all things and whom is our inheritance, as we talked about a few weeks ago. His intention is that we would be able to obtain that inheritance, obtain the reward, obtain the crowns that are laid up for us in heaven, that we would one day rule and reign with him as his servants. God is our Father. And also, He's the God who lives in us and through us. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again the Lord from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do His will, working in you, that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God's desire isn't just to discipline you as a distant father, as a father who's absentee, or a father who's a deadbeat dad, or any of the other things that maybe some of you, when you think of the image of father, that you're thinking, 
I didn't have a very good father. I haven't even seen very good fathers. You know what? When I read the pages of the Bible, one thing that I find is very lacking is models of good fathers. There's some pretty good mothers in there, but I, it's hard to find good fathers, which makes it really hard to preach on Father's Day. But you know who is the model father in Scripture? It's God. He's the father to the fatherless, and he's not distant. He's not overly overbearing. He's everything you ever wished for and ever desired and ever thought that you would want in a father. But even more than that, he actually comes and lives inside of you. He actually is, he's everything. As we've talked about, that every desire that aligns with his desires came from him a motive and the love for God that we have within us as his followers, it comes from him. And that love compels us and the strength, the, the might, the energy, all of it to carry out his will, his, to physically carry out his will, everything comes from him so that he might make us perfect in every good work to do his will, working in us that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And if you're here and you don't have a relationship with this God, with this God, if you don't know where you stand, if you can't say with confidence that if I were to die right now, five years from now, 10 years from now, I know that I would go to heaven. If you can't say that, then you can settle that today from where you're sitting between you and God in your own words that you would just cry out to him and you would say, Lord, save me. I'm a sinner. I believe you died for my sins and I trust completely in Jesus and I want him to, can you come into my life and change me from the inside out? I want to follow you all the days of my life and he will come through on that promise, I promise you. And if you have questions about that, if you want to uh, talk about that, I'm free here to do that. But please, if he's drawing you and he's tugging on you, if there's something in you that resonates with what you heard and you know it to be true, that's him. That's him. He's giving you that faith. Don't harden your heart. And if you're here and you're a Christian, just use this opportunity to completely just meditate on who the God is that you worship. That he is absolutely everything. He is able to intervene in your life. He does care. He is absolutely sufficient and he loves you. And he has communicated with you and he wants you to communicate with him. He's absolutely trustworthy. You can tell him anything. He already knows anyway. He's merciful. You can come to him and you can know that there's forgiveness in him. And he is your father and he cares about you and everything that he does, he does because he wants to conform you into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. He is the power source who lives and moves in and through you. You can have absolute confidence that anything that God is asking you to do, he will do it through you. He will equip you to do it. He will give you the strength to do it. He will give you the desire to do it. You just have to ask him. You have to work out the conflict between your desires, between you and him, saying, Father, if there's any other way, but nevertheless, not, I, not what I will, but thine be done. Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. And so if you go to www.peopleofthefreegift.com, you can access 
all of our articles, all of our videos, all of our podcasts, and everything else our ministry has to offer completely for free. For those who are in a position who are led of the Lord, we do appreciate your donations, and you can do so through that same website. We'd love to connect with you, and so you can catch up with us through the website, through Facebook, through Twitter, Google+, and Pinterest. And we'd love to hear your ideas, your comments, your questions for future podcasts.